Those words were immortalized by Neil Armstrong back in July 1969 when he became the first man ever to walk on the moon. Well, to mark this half centenary, this week's edition of Inside the Americas comes to you from Cape Canaveral in Florida, home to the Kennedy Space Center. And we thought we'd bring you here to find out more about just what happened. NASA was officially formed in July 1958, at a time when the Cold War was already well underway. And the then President Dwight Eisenhower made it his mission to catch up with the Soviet Union in the space race. Back then, there were just 8,000 NASA employees and an annual budget of 100 million US dollars. But five decades later, the number of staff has more than doubled and the budget that President Donald Trump is aiming to give the space agency is in excess of 20 billion US dollars. We are restoring America's proud legacy of leadership in space. Well, half a century since man first set foot on the moon, the United States remains as keen as ever to maintain its lead in space travel. And here at NASA, there's a renewed sense of enthusiasm. The teams have been developed, the capsules being created, and the ambition is to get a person on the moon by the year 2024. We've been given 24 hours of exclusive access to NASA here at Cape Canaveral, it's from here that launches take place, and it's from here that the next manned lunar mission will lift off. Let's have a little look around. Well, this impressive machine that you can see just behind me is what they call the crawler, and it transports rockets all the way from the vehicle assembly building over there to the launch pad, which you can see in the distance. Do you think there's a renewed sense of optimism right now at NASA, given this ambitious uh, target of getting back to the moon by 2024? I mean, this, this is our generation's, our, you know, people alive today's chance to have our Apollo moment or what now will be the our Artemis moment. And so I'm hugely excited to have that deadline. It seems impossible, but great things get done because we make impossible goals and try to reach them. It's all go here at NASA, and some important tests are being carried out for this mission to the moon. We're here to see one of them, the Orion abort function, designed to save the crew in the event of an emergency. This is the Orion capsule, which will carry the astronauts. It has inherited many of the same characteristics as its predecessor, the Apollo, but it's been significantly upgraded. No longer fuel powered, the Orion gets its power from the sun, meaning that missions can last for longer. It's also much lighter than the Apollo, weighing only eight tons as opposed to 18. The Orion is significantly more spacious too, 20 cubic meters instead of nine during the days of Neil Armstrong, meaning it can carry a bigger team. Well, it's nearly sunrise here at Cape Canaveral, and we're waiting for the Orion test to be conducted in the distance, about 15 kilometers away from here. Today, they're testing the abort function. So if the crew have to escape during the ascent phase, they can do so safely. And you'll notice we're right next to the sea here, which means that if the capsule does have to come down, it can come down in the water, and that limits the chances of any civilian casualties. Our launch vehicle is carrying the AA-2 launch abort system. In about 10 seconds, we will see the abort. Jennifer. Was the launch we just saw a success? Oh, yeah. So far, all the data we've looked at, it was a tremendous success. Everything we've looked at, 
operated exactly as we designed it to. What do you see as some be, being some of the biggest challenges in as far as getting people back onto the moon are? Technically speaking, what are those challenges? Well, it's first of all, it's a longer mission in a harsher environment. So for example, for the past 30 years, we've operated in low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit is only a couple hundred miles, 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. And if you have any sort of a problem, you can be back on the surface of the Earth in 90 minutes. You also have the protection of the Earth's uh, atmosphere, which shields a lot of the radiation and, and some of the more harsh and environmental effects. When we go to the moon, first of all, it's a five-day trip. If you're at the moon and anything happens, the spacecraft has to be reliable enough to keep the crew alive all the way until they get back to Earth. The radiation environment is harsher. The, the thermal extremes, the, the hots are much hotter, the colds are much colder. So everything about deep space is more challenging than low Earth orbit. Beyond the moon, do you see a day coming when America might have people walking on Mars or beyond Mars? Yes. Yeah, actually that's our goal. Our goal is to, to send people to Mars. The moon right now is actually a stepping stone. It's a proving ground for us. We've operated in low Earth orbit where we're where we're very dependent, we rely on the Earth for services. When we travel to the moon, again, because of this five-day distance, we're gonna be weaning ourselves off the Earth. We're gonna, we're gonna learn how to operate independent of the Earth. We're gonna learn how to operate in deep space, carry the consumables we need with us, uh, and, and learn how to live and work longer, farther away from the Earth. And it's a really important thing to do before we send people on the journey to Mars. Beyond Mars? Eventually, yes. Yeah, you bet we wanna, we want to explore the solar system. Do you think American public opinion right now is on the side of these ambitions? Because in the past, there's been sort of people saying, oh, it's very expensive. Is this the best way to use uh, public money? What's the feeling in America right now, do you think? Yeah, well, my perception, uh, I will say this, and this is my perception. Uh, first of all, NASA, uh, we're, we're government funded. The taxpayers in our country fund us. And we are a part of the discretionary the budget. And, uh, the money we receive has to be balanced with all the other needs of the country. So I understand that. It might not be everyone's first priority on, on a given day. But I also say that, that taking people into space and the kind of missions we do, the exploration missions, it also is very motivational for the people, very inspirational thing. And I do think these sorts of missions will receive public enthusiasm and public support. So far, 12 people have set foot on the moon. All of them have been men. Do you think the 13th person on the moon will also be a man or a woman? Well, the plan is for the 13th person to be a woman. And it's a different time. In, in the 1960s, when we were sending the people, the, the people that were fighter pilots and military pilots, the people that were selected, were predominantly male. Now we have a much more inclusive environment, and it will be very easy to find a really well-qualified woman to take the next step on the moon. So this new Artemis generation at NASA is filled with enthusiasm, but the legendary Apollo generation, immortalized in history books and in film, lives on. Who can forget this? Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main bus thunderbolt. You see an AC bus thunderbolt there, guy? Or, uh, you come? Jack Lusma, you were the recipient of that message back in 1970. What was happening when you got that message? Well, we're in the control center in Houston, Texas, and the flight director, of course, is the one who runs the show. He's the boss. And uh, we have a capsule communicator, and the capsule communicator is always an astronaut and the only one who talks to the crew. And uh, I know what the crew is doing. I know what they're thinking. We speak the same language. I've trained with them. I've uh, trained for the same thing they're doing. So we have a lot in common. And uh, my main objective when there's a problem, of course, is to make them realize that we have good people working hard on the ground and have confidence that we're working in their best interest. How did you manage to stay calm? Well, I was so busy uh, working in it that I stayed that way. Everybody was working hard, very professional people. They were all experts in their field. They knew what they had to do. We had simulated before. The room was electric with excitement, but nevertheless, everybody was doing their job and uh, very calm about it. Was being an astronaut what you always dreamt you would be? When I was a kid, there were no astronauts. There was Buzz Sawyer and, uh, and, um, and those other fellows that uh, you know, flew in the comic books. And there really were no astronauts until I was a senior in college. And so I never had the idea that uh, I could be one because there was no space program. 
but I loved aviation, airplanes, and uh, that sort of attracted me to aeronautical engineering and, and also to, uh, to the space program because it uh, takes that kind of a uh, background. Um, I want to talk about your experiences in space. What's your funniest moment? Funniest moment, uh, probably when the ground control said, um, you don't have enough underwear, but we'll take care of the problem. And they came back and said, we got good news and bad news. The good news is you're going to get to change your underwear today. The bad news is, Jack, you changed with Owen, Owen, you changed with... <laughs> what was your scariest moment? I can't remember a scary moment, to tell you the truth. I can remember moments when we here were concerned and we're actively thinking about what to do, but I don't, don't remember being scared. Most memorable moment? Probably uh, doing a spacewalk, getting out there and seeing the world as a big round ball for the first time. You know, otherwise you're looking in the window and that's all you see, but now you can see the whole 360 degrees of the Earth, about 1,200 miles in every direction. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Jack Lewis Map. Thank you for talking to us. We're coming to the end of this week's edition of Inside the Americas. As we've been hearing, the ambition that first brought man to the moon 50 years ago lives on. And it could soon be men and women that are going to the moon and Mars, and perhaps even further afield. Well, we leave you here on the Jetty Park Pier, a favorite viewing spot for enthusiasts to watch launches from the Kennedy Space Center, about 20 kilometers away in the distance. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned to France 24.